Welcome, hello, welcome to episode 44. It's been a long time um, of five reasons not to harm your loved ones during quarantine. Today we're going to talk about legal ethics. And the reason I chose this topic for today is because I've been getting a lot of phone calls lately with my lawyers doing this, I really need a second opinion. Or um, this is what's happening in my case, what should I do? And, you know, I'm always happy to talk to people and provide them information um, that helps them make the decisions they need to make. But I really can't, uh, yeah, I, I can't believe uh, the amount of time that is spent with people losing sleep and not understanding what's going on in their cases, regardless of the kind of cases. And so I just wanted to spend a few minutes and try to break down these, um, the, the ethics rules that we live by as lawyers, because uh, I think that that will help you all be better consumers when you need legal services or need a problem solved. And so, um, you know, I wanted to start by, you know, I, I did the session a few weeks ago, a few, well, probably a week and a half ago about how to pick a lawyer. And so I think that this really um, kind of dovetails from that um, as a natural progression. And so um, being a lawyer is an unusual field because we don't have like a policing body um, to make sure that we're doing everything that we're supposed to do. We pass the bar, we pass an ethics exam, and we have to do, um, under certain circumstances for certain areas of practice, we have to do some continuing legal ed education. But if you don't do it, um, you know, there's no, like the state bar doesn't necessarily come down on you and say, hey, you can't be a lawyer anymore. Um, what happens is we are self-policing. So every lawyer and every judge um, has, because well, they are all lawyers, um, we have an ethical duty to report misconduct. So we're literally charged with tattletaling on our own, which is very unique. Um, other other um, businesses, you know, doctors don't do that. Um, there are other bodies that monitor them um, in addition to themselves. So it's it's unique in that way. Um, before we get into the, the actual rules, um, and there are rules, and then there are also um, ethics opinions, which are how the uh, Grievance Commission or Disciplinary Board are interpreting um, the rules. And there's also, you know, informal opinions and formal opinions. And so um, it's there is some precedent um, that you can certainly uh, can be relied upon and some guidance, but usually, you know, at least in my practice or in my office, when we're not sure ethically what we need to be doing, um, there's an ethics hotline and we can just call at the state fire and, um, you know, their advice doesn't necessarily protect you, but it's some guidance. Um, there are some attorneys that practice exclusively in defending lawyers um, of misconduct, and that is definitely a preferred place to ask the questions, I think, when you have them. But half the battle is recognizing that it's an ethics situation. So with that in mind, I wanted to talk to, to you about some definitions. So first and foremost, um, integrity. Integrity and reputation are really all we have. Um, if that, that is sort of something that you know I certainly hold very tight to the vest, and I really think that if you don't have integrity and a reputation of integrity, um, trustworthiness, that you really um, cannot put forward the professional services that are required. So integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness. 
um, reputation is beliefs or opinions that are generally held about someone or something. And professional integrity is the practice of maintaining appropriate ethical behavior. It's the practice of showing strong adherence to moral and ethical principles and values, such as, and this is like the bedrock right here, honesty, honor, dependability, and trustworthiness. And this is why I said, this is how you pick your lawyer. This is what we're bound to. This is what makes you sleep at night. You have to have a relationship with your lawyer that you believe is honest, honorable, dependable, and trustworthy. Because if you don't have those things, then how can you know that they're protecting you, that they're promoting your goals? And, you know, the people think that lawyers' first duty is to their clients, but it's not. Our first duty is to the court and to be candid and honorable to the court. So, um, and we have to balance our, our clients' uh, interests with our obligation to the court, um, protecting confidences, for example. Um, if a client puts us in a situation that we can no longer represent them, when we ask the court to allow us to withdraw, we can't give the reason necessarily because that would violate the client's confidence. The, um, and so it's, it's a balance between those two. And you may have seen when you're in court at times, an attorney will say something like, as an officer of the court, your honor, I can tell you blah, blah, blah. And, um, and so, you know, it may be something as simple as it's raining outside. And, you know, so that's where that stems from is the being candid to the tribunal ethics rule. Um, if a, a lawyer does not uh, comply with the rules of professional conduct, which are online, if anyone really feels like reading them, they're about 70 pages long. Um, maybe it's 85 pages long now that I'm thinking about it. Um, they, um, anyone can file what's called a grievance, which is really a request for investigation by the Attorney Grievance Commission. And you basically fill out a form and you send it in and then it's sent to the lawyer to respond to why they should or shouldn't be investigated. And obviously the lawyer is going to say why they shouldn't be investigated. You should understand that when you do file a complaint against a lawyer or a request for investigation against a lawyer, all bets are off for your um, confidential communications. So if you admitted to the lawyer that you did something and you took a plea offer to something completely unrelated and someone were to come back to the lawyer while you were, um, you know, whether it's the grievance commission or someone else and say, you know, hey, you know, do you think this person is trustworthy? Um, you know, or reliable, um, the lawyer can respond and say, well, he admitted to me that he really, you know, really did it. Or, you know, all bets are off when you attack the lawyer um, for violation of professional conduct. Um, of course, we don't try to just, you know, spill it. Um, you know, it's very important and um, every lawyer does get requests for investigation and criminal lawyers and family law lawyers more than anyone else because often your client, even if they win, isn't happy in either one of those situations. Um, they're also, so that is, um, so when it, when it happens, you know, it's, it's best to have some, you know, communications. Um, I would suggest that every client of any attorney who before you take that step to file a request for investigation that you contact the lawyer and say hey you know i just want to give you a heads up i'm really upset about this i would bet you a hundred percent of the time that lawyer is going to say thank you so much and they're going to try to work something out with you um i think that people citizens don't realize what 
process they're starting and what's at stake. Um, because even if it's without merit, attorneys still have an obligation to answer. And that may mean, you know, hours and hours and hours of work. Um, it may mean, and, and so um, it's, it, and any time that there is a request for investigation to the Grievance Commission, you know, they have to contact the lawyer, the lawyer has to respond, then it has to be reviewed, and then they decide if it's going to be, be turned into a formal complaint or it's going to be dismissed. They, after that, and as I said, anyone can file a request for investigation. You don't even have to be an a, a client on the case with the attorney. Anyone can file it. Um, and then they have, to, and then it will go and it can become a complaint or or it could be dismissed. If it becomes a complaint, then it goes through a hearing process. And that attorney may be wrapped up defending their license for years. Um, so it's something that it should, it should be a conversation, no matter how angry you are or upset you are with your lawyer before you go and file it. Now, of course, there are circumstances that are just so blatantly violations of the rules of professional conduct that go for it. Um, you know, for example, if you have a situation where you were convicted of a crime and it was a, a very um, evidence-based case, there were medical records, there, were, um, there was a, a confession and the person had a very low IQ and that attorney never consulted any experts to help them with your defense or to confront the evidence in your case, then that is, you know, a discussion for another day. And that is, a, that is conduct that should be brought to the Attorney Grievance Commission because the rule number one is, um, well, the, the preamble first, and then we'll get to rule number one. But basically, rule number one is that you have to be competent to take the cases that you take. You have to be competent and know the practice area, know the jurisdiction, um, understand local rules as well as Michigan rules. You have to understand the law in that practice area. Um, you know, for example, I couldn't walk into court tomorrow and defend someone who was injured badly in a car accident. I know nothing about that. Could I consult with that attorney in interpreting the injuries and the fractures, uh, if there's fractures, and what kind of fractures they are, and what type of doctor they might need to be an expert to defend the injuries? Um, yeah. I mean, I, in child abuse cases, I deal with fractures all the time, and I could help another lawyer do that piece of the case, but certainly I would not be competent to handle a car accident. Um, and that is something that is concerning when people call me and tell me they're going to hire the attorney on the corner because they're on the corner. Um, and you can listen to our um, how to pick your lawyer from a couple weeks ago and get all those tips about why you don't just hire the attorney on the corner. Um, so getting back to the rules, um, the, the preamble to the rules says, as a representative of clients, a lawyer performs various functions. As advisor, a lawyer provides a client with an informed understanding of the client's legal rights and obligations and explains their practical implications. As an advocate, a lawyer zealously asserts the client position under the rules of the adversary system. As a negotiator, a lawyer seeks a result advantageous to the client, but consistent with requirements of honest dealing with others. As intermediary between clients, a lawyer seeks to reconcile their divergent interests as an advisor and to a limited extent as a spokesperson for each client. A lawyer acts as evaluator by examining a client's legal affairs and reporting about them to the client and to others in all professional functions that I just described. A lawyer should be competent, prompt, and diligent. 
a lawyer should maintain communication with a client concerning the rep representation. A lawyer should keep in confidence information relating to representation of a client, except so far as disclosure is required or permitted by the rules of professional conduct or other law. And then the preamble goes on and on. It's um, actually, it's actually like five pages long. And it really, um, it, it talks about all of the duties of being a lawyer. And it's not just to, you know, put your case together and take it to court. Um, and, you know, the understanding as a client, the scope of what your lawyer can do, the scope of what they can't do, um, and really making sure that you understand where your expectations should be. Um, for example, uh, obviously when people need a lawyer that comes through my firm, um, they are in an urgent situation. They are freaking out. They have never been in that situation before. Excuse me, even if it's, you know, just a simple divorce. Um, as you know, but really if someone's in trouble, if someone's accused, if someone's at risk of losing their kids, if someone's child is being denied their special ed services, um, you know, whatever it is, um, there's a, there, the client is in a situation that they've never been in before most of the time. And I, as an attorney, need to start the conversation with empathy, with, okay, I know this is scary. I know this is unknown. Let's learn about it together. And I walk them through the process. And I and when we talk about their goals and we talk about what's going to happen procedurally and we talk about, you know, you know, the, in my office, we work as a team and and you'll know which role each person on the team plays. You'll know um, who knows what about your case. If you have a question about billing, you're not going to call me. <laughs> you're going to call the person in our office who handles the billing. Um, you're going to. You know, when we ask you, so who other than you should we, are we authorized to talk to about your case? Um, we have to keep the confidential relationship, but um, between the client and the lawyer, it's not the person paying for the representation and the lawyer, it's the client. And if the client is a child, it's still the client, not the parent, unless the child says, you can talk to my mom about this. Um, so those are um, relationships that we need to make sure are clear and the lines are drawn from the beginning. Um, we want to make sure that our clients know the best ways to communicate with us. You know, in a lot of cases, people want to have a weekly update meeting and that's what we do. We set it up, we set aside an hour, in one of my cases, it's Wednesday at four o'clock. Every Wednesday at four o'clock, I know I'm gonna be talking to this this client and his family, and we're gonna be discussing what's happened in the last week on his case. A lot of things happen behind the scenes on cases, and the reason that you don't get a phone call every time I return an email is because I'm trying to save you money. It's not that it's a big secret, I'm just trying to save you money. So what we do is we do these weekly calls, and then your, the client um, is and the family, if they want the family on the call, um, are fully informed all the time. Now, some people want to call every day and then they usually get their first bill and they change their strategy. Um, obviously, if something is important or something is, you know, time sensitive, then, you know, you should call and you should never hesitate to call. If you're uncomfortable about something going on in your case, it's your case, it's your life, it's, it is, and that is something that attorneys are ethically bound to recognize, and it's really, really important. So um, rule 1.1 to 1.17 deal with the client-lawyer relationship, and rule 1.1 is competence, and we've already talked about that a little bit, but legal competency is, is, that a, is actually written in what a lawyer shall not do, which is interesting. 
a lawyer shall not handle a legal man matter which the lawyer knows or should know that the lawyer is not competent to handle without associating with a lawyer who is competent to handle it. So when we talked about picking your lawyer a few weeks ago, we talked about how you want to hire a lawyer with experience in what you need them to have experience in. You know, all family law attorneys are not created equally. All divorce lawyers are not created equally. Some are really great with taxes and retirement and assets. Some are really great with custody battles and abuse allegations. Some can do it all. But you need to know what the issues are in your case and who's the best person to handle it. If you're charged with sexual assault and there's DNA evidence, you don't wanna hire just a criminal lawyer who's never had to confront DNA evidence before. You don't want to hire a, a criminal lawyer who specializes in drunk driving. Um, so just because they call themselves a criminal lawyer and you're accused of a crime, doesn't mean they're competent to defend your crime. Um, also, juvenile court is totally different than adult court. So you don't wanna hire an attorney to um, defend you in juvenile court if they've never stepped foot in there before. And in, I think it was week two, we talked about the differences between juvenile and adult court. And so they are very significant differences, especially the goals of the courts. One is punishment, the adult court. One is rehabilitation, the juvenile court. So there's a lot of dispositional options and just a lot of, a lot of dynamics that go into defending a case in juvenile court that don't exist in adult court. And then the rule also says um, that um, a lawyer shall not handle a legal matter without preparation adequate in the circumstances. So that would be if the lawyer doesn't have enough time to do it right. If the lawyer doesn't have enough time for your phone calls, if the lawyer doesn't have time to meet with you, if the lawyer doesn't have time to um, do the proper investigation on a case, as well as obtaining the documents or other evidence um, that's adequate for the circumstances. Um, then the other lawyer who sh shall not is neglect a legal matter entrusted to the lawyer. You can't just leave it sitting on your desk for eternity because there's no deadline. Um, and that gets a lot of lawyers in trouble actually. Um, you have an obligation to prepare and investigate and to maintain confidence. That means that if the law changes and it's going to affect some of your cases, you have to know what that legal change is. And it may you may have to reevaluate your cases. You may have to change the strategy uh, to comport with the change in the law. Um, I have a client who I've represented for over 10 years. And in that period of time, um, we have waited for reform with the Sex Offender Registry Act in order to file his appeal and his expungement at the right time. As the law changed over the years, and SORA law has changed, uh, has had a few really major changes over the years, um, the most significant one being just recently when it was found unconstitutional. Um, we would have had really good arguments when we started this case, but because we were patient, now we have great arguments. Now we have, uh, you know, we're not asking the judge to take a risk in granting our relief. Now we're asking the judge to follow the law because we were patient. We knew where the direction the law was going in. We didn't have any statute of limitations problems. And we are now able to do this so that we know we're going to prevail. We're not going to have to appeal. We, we, the law is on our side. So that is, you know, a, the part of this maintaining competence is, is not only knowing what the law is now, you have to know the direction it's going in. You also need to know the tendencies of your judge. You know, for example, yesterday I had a bond hearing with a client that's in jail and I know that this particular judge had let another person charged with it actually a more serious crime than my client out of jail on May 5th um, and they had their cases were very parallel um, you know they were both 
resided in the same community. They both had been in jail for over 600 days. They both were set for jury trials and because of COVID-19, we have no idea when they're actually going to happen. And um, they both um, are facing a possible life imprisonment. Um, one of them, the complainant, lives out of state. That was my case. The other one, the complainant, lived in the community. Um, and so we were pretty sure that the law would be on our side and that she would be consistent. And the prosecutor came up with some really, really damning evidence in the 23rd hour and my client's bond was denied. Um, and prosecutors are held to other ethical standards that we're not going to talk about today, but we can at another time, because I know at least one of you, as I watch the names coming on, is really interested in prosecutorial misconduct. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe we'll do that tomorrow. Um, but anyway, uh, back to the issue at hand, ethics. So maintaining competence and really creating the best strategy to accomplish the best results and of course to accomplish your client's goals is the most important and when some of these people have called me recently and said oh i need a second opinion blah 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 the first thing i say to them is what is your goal is this is whatever they're doing getting you there because i'm not going to give them a true second opinion unless they're my client because i wouldn't be allowed to do that ethically and and so I, you know, just try to help them um, with the inquiry. And, you know, why aren't you sleeping at night? Um, what don't you know? What is what is gnawing at your side? Why do you think you need a second opinion? Um, and just really, it's it's about relationships. And the and so um, it's it's very interesting to me. Like just recently, the amount of distrust that. And, uh, and I mean, I, obviously, a lot of people don't trust lawyers and they don't have a good reputation for being trustworthy. So, you know, that makes sense. But just recently, the amount of people who have called me and said, hey, like, I'm having an issue with my lawyer. What would you do? And, you know, we go through a discussion, you know, I don't, as if they didn't don't have another lawyer. You know, I just talked to them like I would any new possible new client that was calling me. And let's, and let's get to what is best for this client, what this client needs and what this client wants. And so um, that's the most important thing. Um, we talked about scope. I think the thing that, the, that most citizens don't understand is that it, when you hire an attorney, you're hiring them for a matter. What that means is if you have, you know, you're charged with a crime in this county, that is the matter that you are that, that you are hiring them for. Let's say that now when they did a search of your home and they took a bunch of stuff and they want to forfeit it. Forfeiture is a civil proceeding. It's different than the criminal proceeding. It has different parties than the criminal proceeding. Sure, the underlying facts are connected. But if you're if the attorney is also going to represent you on this forfeiture action, they need to execute another representation agreement with you and they need to expand the scope of the representation. Um, if you're charged in another community, that again, you're expanding the scope of the representation, you need to redefine it. And every time, you know, then you get a traffic ticket, you got to redefine the scope of the representation. Um, a lot of times people um, are, you know, they hire a lawyer and then um, all of a sudden they're violating probation on another case in another court because of the conduct in the original case. You have to expand the representation, the scope of the representation. Um, and so, you know, we always have to act reasonably. That's the standard. Um, and, you know, we can't do anything illegal or fraudulent. Um, the rules talk about diligence and what that means. And the rules talk about fees. And this is another thing that I absolutely want to climb the walls about every time I get a phone call about fees. Not my fees, other people's fees. Because I hear over and over and over again, I don't like my lawyer. They're not doing what I want them to do. They don't talk to me. They, and 
my retainer was non-refundable, so I can't switch. Well, I am here to tell you that in most cases, a, that a non-refundable retainer is, is against the ethics rules. So attorneys still have their clients sign for non-refundable retainers. Um, I, I see those agreements often, but let's, let's think about um, this for a minute. So this is rule 1.5 and it says, a lawyer shall not enter into an agreement for charge or collect an illegal or clearly excessive fee. A fee is clearly excessive when, after review of the facts, a lawyer of ordinary, ordinary prudence would be left with a definite and firm conviction that the fee is in excess of a reasonable fee. The factors in determining the reasonableness of a fee include the following. And there's eight different things. And it basically deals with the attorney's experience, the practice area, the novelty of the situation, um, a fee customarily charged by other lawyers who do that work. Um, if the lawyer, if the client comes in and it's emergency and the lawyer has to clear their whole calendar to deal with it because of its urgency, or if they have to turn down other cases because of the urgency of that matter, um, those are all things that can um, play into the fee. And so, and so when, when a lawyer charges a non-refundable fee, you know, they're going to get a large amount of money, you know, up front if it's a criminal case or, you know, a, you know, a significant amount of money if, if it's, a, you know, another kind of case. And, and if they resolve that case in five minutes, they get to keep that money. If that if we had non-refundable fees um, what we, instead what we deal with is it's called a system of quantum Marriott please don't ask me to spell that um, it's in the rules and I can probably find it for you but I don't want to waste that time because um, we're getting a little long here the um, what that means is that you it, it's being compensated based on the merit of the work that you've performed. It's a quantity of merit, um, I believe is the Latin tra translation. So what that means, if in five minutes, I got you an amazing result, that maybe it's reasonable for me to, you know, keep $2,500 or, or $1,000 and but certainly my, my quick resolution that was able to be accomplished because of my skill and experience, my knowledge of, you know, of the law, my uh, relationships with, with other people, um, it, it will never just justify keeping $10,000. It will never justify keeping $25,000. And it will certainly never justify keeping $50,000. And I feel like citizens are misled by lawyers all the time with this notion of a non-refundable fee. And, um, you know, I won't get involved in fee disputes with other lawyers. I don't comment on, you know, the propriety or impropriety of other lawyers' fee agreements. Um, but there are rules and they are... Um, there to be complied with and having an understanding of, you know, the different, the, what you call these, these, uh, this bunch of money, you know, a retainer has a definition, a, a contingency fee has a definition, a representation fee has another definition, an engagement fee has another definition, and certain things about their refundability or not, um, are built in there. So it's very important to, to understand these words and to um, really, uh, you know, make sure that, you, that you're getting into a contract situation and what it means. Um, 
there are there is a rule if a if an attorney accepts property in lieu of payment um, sometimes especially in family law cases um, we lawyers can take a lien on our clients ha um, half of the assets not on the whole thing but on our clients half um, and and you know there's it as I said before there's it's always about um, the reasonableness of the fee and so that's where it's always going to be viewed at um, in our firm we bill hourly so that you know we can show our clients every minute of every hour of every day that we work on their cases um, so that's you know what you know that's one thing that um, you know every client I think regardless if it's a flat fee if it's a non-refundable fee whatever it is um, you know if you want an accounting you should be able to have one the the rules also deal with you know as I mentioned confidentiality of information we already talked about that and and then there's and that's that's obviously huge conflict of interest um, especially if an attorney you know used to be a prosecutor and they're now a defense attorney or vice versa if you used to work for a big firm and now you work for a small firm um, all of those things are dealt with in the rules um, some things are prohibited um, that and are um, conflicts that can't be resolved some things are conflicts that can be resolved it's case-by-case -case basis we have we also cannot um, establish a conflict of interest between a present client and a former client. You know, I can't represent, uh, you know, the wife in a divorce and then the husband in a criminal case later. Um, that would be a conflict. Um, and then, um, you know, basically the, the rules continue and it's, you know, it's a lot of, of factual uh, determinations and on a case-by-case -case basis but it, the bottom line is every attorney needs to practice with integrity and professionalism every client owes transparency to their clients and to the court and as I say like a broken record over and over and over again if you're not sleeping at night you haven't picked the right lawyer because something is not in your comfort zone and we're supposed to be here to help you to take that stress away not to add to it and so um, with that unless anyone has any questions that they want to post right now um, I will uh, say good afternoon and it's kind of muggy but it is a beautiful day regardless and um, I hope to see you all tomorrow. Um, I Five reasons, forgot, I have to finish with that. Um, what will we do when this is over? Um, we'll have to come up with a new tagline. Um, five reasons not to harm your loved ones while in quarantine. Our um, protective services is essential. The police are essential. Um, our jails and prisons are hotbeds for breeding COVID-19. Um, Parents can get in trouble for kids being kids, and very few, if anyone, looks good in horizontal stripes. So with that, um, I just hope you all have an amazing day, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.